So folks, now we're up in uh, the north of Berlin in the district, district of Wedding, the French sector. And look behind me, you can see the top two northern towers of the Humboldt anti-aircraft tower. The rest was destroyed um, in 1948, uh, and now it's buried in hundreds of thousands of tons of uh, rubble from World War II. This view, um, I'm on the uh, northern side of the railway cutting. This view is roughly what the third shock army had as they invaded Berlin. Getting over the railway cutting was difficult. Um, and uh, seeing this huge tower must have also been uh, uh, rather shocking. Uh, but given that it was an impregnable uh, fortress, they just bypassed it. They had a go at shelling through the um, tower doors at the top, so the access doors that the gunners would have, but they didn't know that beyond the uh, thousand kilo metal doors was a corridor and then another set of doors. Um, so uh, they failed to take it, and eventually about a week after World War II, the garrison would come out. Um, some of them, as we'll hear, managed to escape through a tunnel between this, the main uh, battery, um, and the command and control tower, the L tower, that lies behind, also destroyed, on the other side of the park, which we'll check out in a minute. Uh, let's cross the railway tracks. Now, even today, you've still got some dead railway lines. So if you look down here, you can see the tracks that would have uh, come from the armaments factories that would have then been fed into the base uh, of the tower. So the shells for this weighed 55 kilos. They would have been unloaded. You get a nice sense of scale because we are now roughly at the level of the bottom of the tower. Here behind me, you can see what's left of the command and control tower. Again, just like a story of zoo, it was destroyed in the French sector after World War II. Um, so I'm actually standing on a pretty steep slope, you can see here, because these things were all buried, um, both the towers in uh, Humboldtine and where we're going uh, to Friedrichshain, um, the third tower in the east. And they were buried with bits of people's lives. They were buried with rubble from um, World War II. So little train lines were set up. Um, little narrow gauges and they brought cart after cart, thousands and thousands and thousands of cubic metres of rubble and they buried uh, both towers here in the park, blown up at the end of the 1940s. Um, that's one of the reasons why it's worth coming here and having a look. It's on the slopes, there's the roads, um, you can find all sorts of bits of people's lives from World War II. In fact, in Friedrichshain quite recently, I found this thing here. Now, this is a cheroot, like a cigar holder. Um, it's actually a really nice red, it's called a red amber Bakelite cigar holder made in the States in the 30s and 40s. So, always worth coming to have a little rummage about on the Rubble Mountain. Blowing the things up after the war seems a bit kind of odd when you think that, you know, 90% of Berlin was damaged, the city centre, um, about 30% of Berlin was completely destroyed. You know, why destroy um, functioning buildings? Uh, and in fact, if you go to Hamburg, the flag tower there still stands, as does the one in Vienna. But Berlin, of course, was the Nazi capital and the Allied Control Council would meet um, at the end of 1945 and this process of denazification, so eventually getting rid of reminders uh, of the Nazi regime um, for a kind of a relaunch of, the, of German history as quickly as possible, plus, of course, the fact that it would probably be a good idea in the eyes of the four victorious powers to get rid of defensive buildings, the anti-aircraft towers, um, fell under Directive 22, which was, you know, heavily defended military-grade buildings, which these certainly were, um, and that's the reason why in the late um, 40s they were destroyed. It'll be on top of this that the radar um, um, station uh, would be built. So these command and control towers had, on top of them, um, a, a roof that could open up from 1942, this was actually the last of the um, flag tower um, pairs to be constructed. It wasn't finished until early 1942. Zoo flag tower um, from late 40, early 1941. That was built by German contractors, um, supplemented by a few um, POWs and prisoners of war. Um, by 1941-1942, um, the labour shortage within Germany was becoming more acute, so you had people who definitely hadn't been asked, so essentially slave labourers uh, working on the construction of these two, and in between comes the Friedrichshain uh, Tower. But when this was finished, a new radar system had been developed, 
um, by Nazi Germany, uh, and that was called the Würzburg Giant. So, the kind of like James Bond, the top of this tower would open, and the radar would come up and do its thing, uh, and then during bombing raids, um, it could sink uh, down and the roof could then be closed. You had some kind of pom-pom. Um, both these towers um, had uh, two or 3.7 millimeter um, kind of close quarter dive bomber anti-aircraft guns on the top. Um, and then within this, um, you'd have uh, um, a group, groups of men working um, in communication with the tower a few hundred meters away. Um, about the information that they'd need to shoot down the planes. So, um, from the radar prior to that, they had what was essentially a legacy of World War One, which was essentially glorified telescopes and binoculars trying to spot the planes, hence the need for it to be a way of the smoke um, from the guns of the main tower during uh, um, bombing raids. But then, using what was essentially a kind of a proto-computer machine, electronically, through a uh, tunnel, and then that tunnel contained cabling and piping, etc. Um, all of these towers were fully self-contained. They got their own heating system, they got their own water sources, they got their own power generation. There was a tunnel that ran under the park um, from here um, to the towers. That would give the information, um, which was essentially height, speed and direction. Um, with that information, the 19 men crews that manned the twin barrel 128mm anti-aircraft guns on top of the towers themselves would be able to project, so in the future, if they don't change speed, height or direction, they will be in this piece of the sky. That was called the firebox. They would then set the timer fuses in the nose of this 28 kilo shell and start pumping those things into the sky. 128 millimeter anti-aircraft gun had a ceiling for the shell of nearly, well, it's 14,800 meters. So, I mean, you know, it's about the height of a, uh, of a jetliner um, cruising altitude today. I mean, a really serious business with a 28 kilo um, high explosive. Um, what they're trying to do is fill the sky with red hot bits of metal, shrapnel uh, or flak, as the bombers would call it, crashing through the sky and cutting into aircraft. So these two towers would protect uh, from the northern approaches. A few years ago, discovered by the Berlin Underworld Association, who documented, uh, who have, since the fall of the wall, have documented um, underground structures within Berlin from World War II or otherwise. I worked for them since 2006. Um, there was an eyewitness um, saying that um, when the um, Humboldtheim flak tower eventually surrendered, and that was about a week later than the zoo flak tower. The zoo flak tower was controlled by a man called Colonel Haller. Um, he had agreed with the Russians because when the Russians arrived at the end of World War II, you had um, uh, the Third Shock Army, the Fifth Shock Army, and the Eighth Guard Tanks Army um, moving through past these guard towers. They realized there was nothing to do about, uh, they could do about them, so they just bypassed them and left them. They were packed with civilians. Zoo Flak Tower, they reckon 30, 35,000 people in there uh, at the end of World War II. So every available space uh, uh, had been filled. But um, at the Zoo Flak Tower, Colonel Haller agrees with the Russians outside that he was going to open the doors and surrender the tower um, at midnight um, on the 1st of May, 1945. Um, so after it had been announced that Hitler was dead, the day after that, um, the ceasefire would be called um, at about uh, uh, lunchtime uh, in Berlin, so on May the 2nd. But here, there was some slightly more fanatical resistance. They held out for about a week, um, and some of the people managed to escape. So the Berlin Underworld um, found uh, this eyewitness. He managed to escape with a couple of friends through this small communications tunnel that went from the main tower uh, to here with the cables and the piping within it. So a few years ago they went out with a magnetometer to try and pick up this tunnel uh, and they found it um, full of sort of noxious fumes but that still exists lying below the park. So getting a bit closer. So you're looking at uh, the most visible bit of what was 100,000 tonnes of concrete per tower, 10,000 tonnes of reinforcing steel per tower. Each tower cost 45 million Reichmarks to build and this one, one more time, shot down just over 20 aircraft. Now I've actually uh, climbed all the way at the bottom of this one uh, in the uh, late 90s, I think it was, not really sure. We went in the doors at the top, climbed down all through the crushed five stories, could be like caving, got to the bottom. At the bottom on all four sides there were doors um, and that would mean of course that um, the up to 15,000 people that could shelter in here could come in uh, uh, easily uh, and leave uh, easily. But we got all the way to the bottom. One of the doors was big enough for trucks to come in. Um, the glowing paint signs were still up and it was full of rubble. And I remember in the rubble, I found this little thing here. This is a, it's like a, shaped like a beer stein. It's made of stoneware. Uh, it's from Munich and it's actually an uh, Encyon. That's a schnapps, like a, uh, a little shot glass. Um, 
eyewitness accounts from what it was like sheltering in here. And when these things were built, at the bottom level, they put in a layer of gravel. Uh, and the idea would be that, that would absor absorb the massive uh, downward percussion from the 128 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. Um, what it meant was that the entire building kind of um, swayed. Um, one uh, kid who was in there as a boy said it sort of felt like it was moving, moving like a ship. And in fact, it was so frightening, however safe it was, the feeling of being in there was so frightening, his mum didn't want to go there because um, opposite me on the other side of the road, part of Gazumba and the station becomes a bunker, one of two in what is Berlin's deepest station. So you can see uh, what it's used for now. This is now a free climbing wall. Um, not the post-war use the Nazis had planned. Had they won World War II, these things, though useful for the future, as well as during World War II, would have been clad in brown brick, carved stone, uh, and they would have been used for civilian use. So you would have had, and in fact, during World War II, for the um, actual staff, the garrison of the bunker, there were little concerts on the top. But the idea would be that these things would be clad to make them look less martial. Uh, and then inside, you'd have businesses. Um, uh, there would have been restaurants, uh, concert venues, those sorts of things. And of course, they would stand uh, as a strong defensive building should there be uh, a conflict that breaks out after World War II. At the end of the day, these things aren't going anywhere. Here you can see these, where the windows used to be, and these strange bulges. This was blown up in 1948, uh, the third attempt by the French sappers. They claimed that um, what they were trying to do was make sure that all the rubble here didn't fall down onto the railway track just here. Um, that's possible, um, it might be possible, they just goofed. But what they did was they left these front two towers, the whole back, so the whole backside uh, collapsed, leaving it as a kind of a wedge shape, so you've got five stories uh, squashed down. But one of the reasons they had to get enough labor, and this one here would use slave, slave labor, um, was that when they poured the concrete, you're looking at 10,000 tons of uh, reinforcing steel in each of these, hundreds of thousands of tons of, uh, of concrete. You need to pour the concrete in one pour, pour after pour after pour into the formwork, um, which you can actually still see. The metal, the, uh, if you look here, you can still see where the planking was, the marks there, planking, um, inside which would be the re rebar frame and the concrete would be poured. If, if you pour chunks of the concrete and let it set, uh, and then pour more, you can get these seams, and they didn't want that, of course, they had what this single pour. Um, but here you can see the power of the French explosion pushing these chunks around the window frames uh, um, out. The ground floor would have uh, water power um, sources and the main uh, um, entrances, the first three stories above ground could be used as um, civilian shelter. Um, in fact, during World War II, you had businesses working in here, one specifically, um, relative to uh, or related to air raids was there was a business here that would dismantle um, elements of downed British uh, fighter aircraft trying to work out how the radar system works so that they could jam it actually took place uh, within here as well. Top two floors, so floors four and five were for the garrison and then on top you had two levels of gun emplacement. On the lower level, so this area here, you had the two and 3.7 millimeter flak um, and uh, by 1943 1944, they were being um, actually manned by what were essentially teenage schoolboys. Um, and then on the very top, so here, you had the 120 meter, millimeter uh, anti-aircraft guns. All three would have been clad um, for civilian use, but in terms of remains, this one and a half Northern Towers um, is the most visible of the three flag towers. Uh, soon, we'll go off to Friedrichshafen. So here we are on the top. One of the 128 millimeter guns would have been there. One would have been on this turret. And you can see how it dominates the skyline. So that's a route that's looking north. The other two towers would have been over here. So one there and one across here, all gone. That's the side that collapsed. But out over here, difficult to see, that is the city center. Uh, in fact, if you can see this building here, just next to that is the Reichstag Parliament building. So this is down on the lower level where the flak helpers, helpers as they were called, these kids would work the guns. The guns would sit here and spin, um, but of course you couldn't have a 360 degree range here, so they had to put railings up in case in their excitement um, they kind of spun around and fired at the actual crews that were here as well. Here you can see one of the access doors to the lower level for the garrison and the staircases up to the tower. So up there would have been 128mm anti-aircraft gun. 
Um, all of these have been blocked in. In the late 70s, people managed to get in here, kids. Uh, and in the 80s, a student got in here, didn't really work it out because he didn't realize that to aid the um, destruction, um, the French had taken the spiral staircase out that's beyond that door, so he fell and uh, his body was found uh, later. But I mentioned the Russians gave it a pounding trying to get through the doors. You can see here all the damage concreted over. So we're at the top of the Friedrichshain anti-aircraft tower. Behind me you can just see one of the few bits of the original concrete. That's one of the top uh, towers for the 128mm anti-aircraft guns uh, that we can still see on this one. So I'm at the top of the mountain um, and uh, it dominates the heart of the old city and the eastern skyline. Now a place, as you can see, on a sunny spring day for the people of the district of Friedrichshain. Uh, to come and play. So this was the um, second of the towers to be built. So remember Zoo, they started a couple of months after the first bombing raid. Um, even a Zoo tower uh, was being finished early 1941. Uh, um, uh, the ground had been broken for this and it had a similar 24 hour a day pouring process. Remember the idea that you needed to pour the concrete with no pauses? Otherwise different reinforced sections would dry at different times. You need to have this sort of seam, this sort of weakness uh, um, within it. So they had a 24 hour pouring program here. It took six months to build. Um, and uh, then it opens to protect uh, from the east. It was the second one to be built, but it was the first one to be destroyed. So by 1945, the Russians were in charge of the city, and it would be here that the 5th Shock Army would arrive. The main thrust for the Battle of Berlin would be the Red Army coming through the eastern side. And although the uh, anti-aircraft towers produce some pretty serious resistance, because, of course, they could use their 128mm anti-aircraft guns to drop shells on uh, the invading army, uh, essentially, the 5th Shock Army of the Red Army would just bypass this, and the 3rd Shock Army would bypass the Humboldtine, coming in from the north, and the 8th Guards Tank Army would come in past the zoo town, and they'd just leave them. Um, just like the zoo, you had cultural material stored in here, so they had uh, over 400 um, paintings from the old National Gallery, together with things like archival materials, so documents, rare paperwork, books, uh, um, stored within here as well. And then, in early 1946, the Russians made their first attempt to destroy it. Now they packed it with explosives and failed. But by the spring of 1946, they just literally blew this thing in half. One of the stories is that the um, shell depots for the anti-aircraft guns were still full. The munitions, remember the munitions were brought up on these uh, chain cradles to the 72-ton domed magazine on the top, which would have been there. Um, th th those munitions were still inside, and that kind of helped the... Uh, uh, explosion. But by 1946, by the spring, they just chopped it in half uh, and uh, now it's been buried to become the Bunker Mountain here in the Friedrichshain Park. So you've now seen the pinnacle of Nazi defensive concrete during World War II uh, in Berlin, or what's left of it, and I look forward to showing you something else uh, in Berlin in the near future. So hope you enjoyed and I'll see you next time.